the ECB have pumped over a thousand billion euros into the financial system. But what about inflation? Today, I'm joined by Dr. Frank Hollenbeck to discuss this. Hi, Dr. Frank. Welcome to the studio. Hello. So a lot of people seem to think that this last round of loans will be the last one. What do you think? Well, it's a bit like the US. Uh, we had QE1, QE2, QE3. I wouldn't be surprised to see LR, LTRO1, 2, and 3. Um, it is true that uh, the central bank uh, has recently said that it's going to concentrate on inflation. Uh, the interesting thing is that their actions, which is the uh, LTRO, where they put a trillion euros into the system, has made inflation more likely and also has probably increased the expectations of inflation into the future. Um, let's look at what this LTRO did. Uh, a lot of people are praising uh, the central bank because it's limited uh, what is called a liquidity risk. In other words, what we had back in December is a situation where banks weren't lending to other banks, and therefore the central bank stepped in and took up the position of lender. Okay? But we have to understand is why was it that banks weren't lending to other banks? And the reason is, is that basically a lot of European banks are bankrupt, and you don't want to be lending money to an entity who's not going to be around tomorrow morning. In other words, what a liquidity crisis probably would have done us some good because what it would have done is it would have forced governments to do what they need to do with the banking sector in Europe. In the U.S., we recapitalized the banks in 2008, and so did uh, Great Britain. We haven't done that in Europe. We have a situation where a lot of banks are, I would say, teetering on the edge of default. And take, for example, the case of um, Spain. A lot of banks made enormous amount of loans to the housing sector, and they currently are holding loans that are basically not really worth the paper they're written on. Okay? And what we need to do in Europe is something that Sweden did back in 1990. Uh, Sweden, in 1988, had 525 banks, and they also had a banking crisis. And the thing that Sweden did is they took a hardline approach. They, they made it very clear what their strategy was going to be. And uh, what they did is uh, they bought up some toxic assets uh, and they sold them off relatively quickly so they wouldn't be a drag on the economy. They also recapitalized the banks, they nationalized some banks, and they forced a lot of the other banks to uh, merge with other banks. We went from a situation where we have 525 banks in 1988 to 124 banks by the year 2000. In other words, we had a total re restructuring of the banking sector. We need the same thing. And a liquidity crisis would have forced European governments to do what is necessary, which is to recapitalize the banks. Higher oil prices are pushing up inflation, and normally this would prompt the ECB <coughs> to hike up their rates. This isn't expected this time. Why is that? Well, we're in a situation where we're heading into a recession in Europe, so it's highly improbable that the ECB will hike rates. The first thing is, is higher oil prices doesn't necessarily mean higher inflation. I think that's a big mistake people make in the sense that higher oil prices, if the price of oil goes up and you have a certain amount of income and you're spending more money at the gas pump, then you're going to spend less money everywhere else, okay? In the sense that uh, if oil prices go up, other prices should fall and therefore the average price could either go up or down. We don't know what will actually happen. It depends on the elasticity of supply and demand. Now, when we talk, when we talk about inflation, it's a monetary phenomenon. In other words, inflation comes from an increase in the money supply. Um, I liked recently, I read an article where uh, it was stating that China was going to um, sacrifice growth to be able to quell uh, inflation, its inflation problem in the sense that growth leads to inflation. In other words, people think that growth means that we're buying more goods, therefore the prices of goods going up. Growth doesn't lead to inflation. Actually, growth leads to deflation. Um, I gave a simple example before where we had uh, 10 apples and $10, okay? And the price of the apples would be 
per apple. Okay? If we double the number of apples, which is 20 apples for $10, then the price of the apples go to 50 cents. So we have deflation. It's very much what we saw in the 20th century where industrial, uh, the Industrial Revolution actually caused prices to drop because we were producing so much more goods and services. Or like what we see in the high-tech industries, is even though there's enormous amount of demand, we have a much greater supply, and therefore prices of PCs and everything else have been declining. Okay? Now, the, uh, the, in the example I just gave you, if we have 10 apples and we increase the money supply to $20, then prices will go from $1 to $2. That's inflation. But that's due to the increase in the money supply. So w one of the things that we, it's very important to realize is that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. And that's something that's very important to uh, not forget. Put simply, the LTROs are an experiment. Nobody knows quite what's going to happen. If there is an adverse effect on inflation, what steps do you think the ECB will take to combat this? Um, I want to come back on the issue of inflation. I think one of the problems we have, and it comes from economic theory. Economic theory uh, is um, the classical economists and the monetarist economists based the economic theory on what is called the quantity theory of money. And the quantity theory of money was that money times velocity was equal to price times quantity. And in the original quantity theory of money, quantity was anything, anything money could be spent on. And prices was anything that money could be spent on. In other words, it could be uh, consumer goods that we see in the CPI, but it could also be bonds, it could be housing, it could be uh, stocks, it could be everything. Okay? One of the simplifications of the quantity theory was to write it as M times V is equal to P times Y where Y was real income and P was either the price deflator or the CPI. The problem is, is that we have central banks concentrate on either the price deflator or the CPI. So it's kind of like looking at a part of the force that's not burning while the rest of the force is burning around you. For example, a lot of people are, um, if you look at Germany at the moment, housing prices are going up. And it's not just housing prices, it's the price of any real assets. And that's because one of the reasons is because the enormous amount of money that the central bank has put into the system, which is basically causing individuals to go toward real assets, but also pushing up the price of those real assets because of the additional liquidity in the system. So the ECB is saying is we don't have a price inflation problem. It's a bit like what happened in, um, in the U.S. Uh, during the 2001-2007 period. Is the U.S. was saying that we don't have an inflation problem while housing prices were going up 20-30% every year in the sense that they weren't looking at the entire price uh, possibilities. In other words, the price of all of everything. And that's one of the big problems we've, that we have is the way we follow monetary policy is we should really be concentrating on the price of everything. The problem is, is that we have no way of measuring the price of everything because we are not able to put the right weights on uh, the price of different things. Greece is often a source of uncertainty within Europe, but it seems that a lot of other countries could be set to follow suit. It's not clear yet whether Spain is going to meet its deficit targets. If it does follow the Greek road, is Europe going to be able to bail out its fourth largest economy? Well, Spain has just said that it won't be able to meet its 4.4% deficit target, and it's being, going to be closer to 5.8%. Uh, that's kind of like someone who goes on a diet and says, I'm really going to go on a diet next year, not this year. And so you really have to question whether they'll be able to hit a 3% target in 2013. But even if they do, uh, if they have a contracting economy, it means that their debt is going to be increasing. So the situation still gets worse, even if we're at 3%. The thing about Spain is that its current debt to GDP ratio is about 70%. The problem with that is that it doesn't include a lot of things. Uh, one of the things it doesn't include are unpaid bills. Unpaid bills are about 7% of GDP. Uh, for example, recently Madrid uh, allocated 30 billion to pay um, garbage collection uh, things, uh, money that they owed. We also have um, that a lot of um, government uh, companies have debt, which is about 5% of uh, GDP. We also have that their pension system 
uh, also holds about 5% of um, Greek uh, of Spanish government debt. So if we were to include all of that, it would be uh, we would be in the situation where the debt to GDP ratio would be closer to 90%. You take into account guarantees that the Spanish government have has given on assets that have been deposited at the ECB, then we get almost close to 100%. Okay, so uh, the actual debt situation for uh, Spain is a lot worse than uh, a lot of people realize at the moment. The fiscal compact, which imposes fines if countries fail to meet their deficit targets, is all signed and in place. Are we going to see it actually being enforced if a lot of countries fail to meet their targets? Well, they fail to meet the targets, uh, the 3% uh, deficit target and the 60% uh, debt to GDP targets and uh, nothing was done. Um, it is true that this fiscal compact is a great idea. The problem is, is it doesn't solve our current problem. And uh, like the case of France, which is likely to be running a, a large deficit this year, and with a new socialist government who's basically said is going to try to renegotiate this fiscal compact, you have to be, you really have to question the effectiveness of this fiscal compact in the future, given the current situation that we're in in Europe. Finally, was Greece just the tip of the iceberg? Are we going to see a lot more countries following suit? And can the Eurozone cope? We have a situation where countries are following in Greeks' footsteps, and we have a program train wreck uh, in the future. I don't think, I don't see any way we can avoid it. I remember two years ago, uh, while I was teaching class, I felt like Chicken Little who was screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, we're going to go off the edge. And I felt that nobody in Europe was listening, and in the sense that I still feel the same way, in the sense that we have to turn the train around and we have to go a different direction or we're going to find ourselves going over the cliff. And we have to remember that what happened in the 1940s was due to what happened in the 1930s. And I'm afraid the future looks pretty bleak at the moment unless we radically change the way we look at social spending and our cradle to grave uh, socialist policies in Europe or we're in for a rude awakening in the future. Well, thanks, Dr. Frank. Some strong statements there, as always. As usual, we'll be keeping a close eye on all the developments within the Eurozone, so stay tuned to Dukascopy TV.